Okay. Good morning and welcome to the Office of Tax Appeals, also known as OTA. My name is Andrew Wong. I'm the Lead Administrative Law Judge, or ALJ, who will be conducting the oral hearing for this case. On today's panel, in addition to myself, we have Judges Suzanne Brown and Josh Aldrich. Also present is our stenographer, Ms. Lynn Alonzo. This hearing is being live streamed to the public and a video recording will be made available on OTA's YouTube channel. Also, Ms. Alonzo will report this hearing verbatim and prepare an official hearing transcript which will be made available on OTA's website. To, go, uh, to help Ms. Alonzo make a clear record, I have four requests. And this is just a reminder of what was covered at the pre-hearing conference. Number one, please speak slowly, clearly, and directly into your microphone. Uh, Oh, and the microphone is in front of you. There's a button you can push to turn it on, and it'll be on. It'll be signaled by a green light. If the light is on, your microphone will be on. And then when you're done speaking, please turn it off, just so it doesn't catch any ambient uh, noises and whatnot. Number two, please do not speak over each other or interrupt when someone uh, else is speaking. Number three, please answer verbally and with words. And number four, please, again, mute your microphones when not speaking. If Ms. Alonzo cannot hear, understand, or identify someone who is speaking, she has permission to interrupt the oral hearing at any time to get clarification. Uh, this oral hearing is before OTA, which is a separate agency from the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration, or CDTFA. OTA is not a court, but is an independent appeals body and is staffed by tax experts and is independent of the st uh, state's tax agencies. Uh, my co-panelists and I are co-equal decision makers and may ask questions of either party during the hearing. Further, our panel of three ALJs will decide all the issues presented to us, and each of us will have an equal vote in making those decisions. Uh, now let's uh, prepare to get on, go on the record. Ms. Alonzo, are you ready? All right, let's go on the record. This is the appeal of Day Riverside Petroleum, LLC, before the Office of Tax Appeals. This is OTA case number 21027297. Today is Wednesday, May 10th, 2023. The time is 9.33 a.m. We are holding this hearing in person in Cerritos, California. I am Lead Administrative Law Judge Andrew Wong, and with me today are Judges Suzanne Brown and Josh Aldrich. We are the panel hearing and deciding this case. Individuals representing the appellant taxpayer, Day Riverside Petroleum, LLC, please identify yourselves for the record. Gilbert Tauberg. I'm the owner of. Thank you. And who is uh, sitting with you? My wife. Would you like to identify her for the record, please? Uh, her name is Mina Tauberg. Thank you. Uh, individuals representing the respondent tax agency, California Department of Tax and Fee Administration, could you please identify yourselves? Randy Suazo, hearing representative, CDTFA. Jason Parker, Chief of Headquarters Operations Bureau with CDTFA. Christopher Brooks, Tax Counsel for CDTFA. Thank you. We are considering four issues today. Number one, whether the amount of unreported taxable sales should be reduced. Number two, whether the amount of excess collected tax reimbursement should be reduced. Number three, whether the amount of unreported taxable rebates should be reduced. And number four, whether appellant was negligent or intentionally disregarded applicable authorities. Uh, Mr. Talberg, is that a correct statement of the issues? Yes, it is. CDTFA? Yes, it is. Thank you. Uh, appellant, let's um, move on to the exhibits. Uh, appellant has identified and submitted proposed exhibits one through six as evidence. And uh, Mr. Talberg, you had no other additional exhibits? No, I don't. Thank you. And CDTFA, did you have any objections to those proposed exhibits? No objections. Okay, thank you. Appellants, exhibits one through six will be admitted into the record as evidence. And CDTFA has identified and submitted proposed exhibits A through H as evidence. Uh, CDTFA, you had no other exhibits, is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Mr. Talberg, did you have any objections to CDTFA's proposed exhibits? No, I don't. Thank you. Um, so CDTFA's exhibits A through H will be admitted into the record as evidence. Uh, Mr. Talberg, you had no witnesses, correct? That is correct. And CDTFA, you also had no witnesses, is that right? That is correct. Okay. All right, it was anticipated that this oral hearing would take approximately 55 minutes. Uh, Mr. Talberg, you asked for 20 minutes. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. Um, you can divide that between your opening and your closing. Do you, do you have an idea of how you wanted to allocate your time? 
Uh, no, I do not at the present time. Okay. But most, uh, most of it will probably be the opening statement. Okay. Um, I'll just try to keep track of your time, and then whatever you have left over, you could use in your closing and rebuttal. Does that sound fair? That is fine. Okay. And then um, CDTFA, you had also asked for 20 minutes. Is that correct? That is correct. <laughs> okay. Um, did you, either party have any, uh, any questions before we uh, start? Mr. Chalberg, do you have any questions? CTFA? No, I do not. Thank you. CTFA, any questions? No questions. Okay. Mr. Tauberg, uh, please proceed with your presentation. You have 20 minutes. Your Honors, thank you for taking the time to hear my appeal. The results of the audit for the period of October 1st, 2012 through September 30th. Mr. Tauberg, I'm oh, sorry. Could you pull the uh, microphone closer, closer to you and speak into right. it? Um, even though we can hear you in the room, it might not be uh, clear to uh, the people on YouTube or right. for the record. Thank okay, you. That's fine. The results of the audit for the period of October 1st, 2012 through September 30th, 2015 showed that they, Riverside Petroleum, owed $141,790.33 plus $21,031 and 39 cents interest and fourteen thousand one hundred and seventy nine dollars and five cents penalty for a total of one hundred seventy seven thousand dollars and seventy seven cents in addition to that amount they have added sixty three thousand three hundred nineteen dollars and twenty seven cents in additional interest i am trying to show that i should not have to pay the above amount because of errors that the computer system provided by British Petroleum were giving to us and to the Board of Equalization. Since the results of the audit of Day Riverside Petroleum were provided to me, I have been trying to convince first the Board of Equalization and now the Department of Tax and Fee Administration that the software system provided by British Petroleum, which was called Retalix, was providing incorrect data both to me and to the board. I was told by them repeatedly that because of a lawsuit between the ARCO AMPM franchisees and, Petro and British Petroleum was still ongoing, they would not look at it until everything was finalized. Exhibit 1 shows that there were 508 franchisees in California participating in the lawsuit against British Petroleum. Other lawsuits were proceeding in Oregon, Washington, Nevada, and Arizona. The lawsuit, which is shown in the Exhibit 2, had two parts. The first part was for vendor manipulation, and the second part was because of the retaliate system. The results of the Superior Court trial were that the vendor manipulation portion was declared, was decided in favor of British Petroleum and the retaliate portion was decided in favor of the franchisees. Both parties decided to appeal the Superior Court decision. Exhibit 4 shows the opening brief before the appeal of the court. The appeal of court agreed with the Superior Court decision, which is shown in Exhibit 5. To sum up the decision of both the Superior and Appellate Court, British Petroleum was found at fault for providing their franchisees with a computer system that was inadequate and faulty and that the franchisees had lost a considerable amount of money because of it. At the time of the audit, I did not know that the Retallic system was providing incorrect data until the result of the audit was shown to me. The audit shows that as of the first quarter of 2015, something happened because of differences between the audit and what was reported was very, was very small. Why was this? At the end of 2014, the retaliate system was replaced with a new system, it, and we were not doing anything different in preparing the quarterly sales tax returns. During the time that the franchisees were required to use the retaliate system, and errors were shown up in the system, I offered to work with the British Petroleum's Retallics Group to try to fix this, the system. You may ask why I thought I was qualified to help British Petroleum resolve their problems. 
For over 40 years, I was a computer consultant to various governments. The Plan and Budget Organization of, the Iran, of Iran and the Office of the President of the United States. I was also a consultant to various com international companies, including Aramco, Arabian American Oil Company, and Nestle. During the appeal process with the Board of Equalization, the Department of Tax and Fee Administration and the Office of Tax Appeals, I have tried to speed up the process so that the matter could be resolved. I have either talked to them or written to them several times each year. Each time that I asked, I was told this would go through the normal processing and it takes time. The, the issue of the Board of Equalization move, uh, changing to the Department of Tax and Fee Administration also did not help. The issue of COVID-19 did not help. It caused people to have to work from home and a lot of work took longer for normal work to complete. 26 months ago, I filed an appeal with the Office of Tax Appeal. I was told that they would not give me an approximate time frame, but I would be notified about 45 to 75 days before the hearing. I called back numerous times to see if anything changed on the status of the appeal, but I was told I would have to wait and I would be notified. The Retalic system has been proven to be a very faulty system because of modifications made by the British Petroleum to the software that they bought. Both the Superior Court and the Appeals Court agreed that the British Petroleum was at fault for providing such a faulty system and penalized them because of it. Knowing that both courts agreed with the, fr the franchises about the system, that ruling makes it hard to decide which side is right and the amount due by Dave Riverside Petroleum. I honestly believe that it should be substantially lower than $141,790.33 that the Department of Tax and Fee Administration says is due, since it has taken seven years in spite of my constant request to speed up the appeal process. I strongly recommend that the Department of Tax Appeals waive all the interest, penalties, and reduce the initial amount of $141,790.33. As far as the other item you brought up uh, about the money that have gotten rebates on there, the tax appeal figures that as income because I would I reduce the price that I'm selling it to the to the customer on it. That that is not true. Those those amounts was not factored at all into the selling price. Those amounts are given after the fact. By the vent by the uh, co the companies to uh, so that we would sell their products. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Mr. Talbert. Uh, just one moment while I take some notes. Okay. Um, I will now turn to my um, co-panelists for questions. Uh, you have 12 minutes left for a rebuttal and closing, just to let you know. Uh, I will turn first uh, to Josh, uh, Judge Aldrich. Hello, uh, good, good morning. Um, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions regarding the timing. Um, so I understand that retalics was uh, an issue for you, according to your argument. When did you discover uh, that it was causing problems? Retalix was causing problems as, as soon as they uh, installed it onto our, the system. Uh, problems were reported uh, uh, multiple times every week to them and they were fixing. Every site was having different different sets of problems. I didn't realize that it was reporting differently uh, data in there until the, until the audit was done and the results were shown to me. So when you say audit, are you saying the audit issue or the prior audit? I'm talking about when it was 
Okay. Um, and then, um, would it be fair to say that you were required to use Retalics um, uh, according to your franchisee agreement? Yes, Retalics was required. We were not allowed to uh, put in a, a different type of computer system. But ultimately, a different computer system was put in? Uh, British, Petro uh, British Petroleum sold ARCO uh, to Tesoro, and part of the uh, thing was that they had to get rid of the Retallic system okay. at a certain point. So you didn't take an independent action of like getting a new POS system? No, I was not. A, by the contract that I had with uh, uh, ARCO, that I'm not, I was not allowed to. I had to use the s computer system provided. Okay. And then um, just in general terms, could you tell me how your reporting process would work uh, with Retalics? Um, would that populate a sales and use tax return? Or were you taking the data from that and then using that to... Uh, basically, we would call up uh, the support the support number, report a problem on there. And they would, go, uh, they had the capability to go into the system and look at it, and try and try to resolve the problem. Okay. All right. Um, that's all the questions I had at the moment. I'm going to return it to uh, Judge Wong. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Aldrich. Uh, Judge, Judge Brown. Thank you, um, Mr. Tauberg. I wanted to ask about the. Uh, court complaint in October of 2012 that uh, you're, you were a party to. I, I understand that the appellate court ruled on the other complaint where you weren't a party. Um, I wanted to ask what happened to the one where you were a party. Um, it said in the Appeals Bureau decision, for example, that it was in settlement. Yes, it was. The it went into a settlement conference on there, which I can't remember how much, how long it lasted, and because of the time it had taken for all this stuff to go through, I don't think it settled till about 2020 or I think it was somewhere around 2020 or 21, somewhere around there. Uh, we both we both settled on an agreement that was split between all the equally between all all the parties of the agreement. And is there any evidence of that that we have? I could not uh, find a document that the attorneys had sent to me on that. The attor the attorneys that. W we had is no is no long is no longer there. He, he even moved out of California, and I don't know where he is. One second. I had another question. Um, in the doc in in the. Um, the documents, there was a reference to a different POS point of sale system that you had it uh, that you had submitted sales re that were created from a or recorded from a different POS system. Was Retalix the only POS system you were using during the audit period? During this audit period, that was the only one, except. It w I, uh, at the at the very end, uh, they replace it with another one, and I, I don't even know what they even called that one. You know, we just talk, we just call it the uh, the back office system. I think that's all that I have right now. So I will turn back to Judge Wong. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Brown. Uh, I believe jo uh, Judge Aldrich has a, another question for you. Hi. Uh, yes. Um, so during your opening, uh, you discussed interest. Uh, are you asking for interest relief? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, so 
I didn't see, I saw the negligence penalty was at issue, but I didn't see that interest relief uh, was a, a, an issue. Um, so um, I, I was hoping you could explain which exact periods uh, you're asking for interest relief. I'm asking for interest relief uh, because the time frame it was taken to do all the COVID delayed everything for for quite for quite a while period of time. The t uh, time when the board of equalization was split into two uh, different organizations, uh, the people the people in the new tax and fee administration when it got started didn't know what was going on what was going on and that was delaying everything for at least a year okay so to be clear you're, you're asking for interest relief while it was at cdtfa in the appeals process and then also while it was at the office of tax appeals uh, basically for those times but it was still taking longer for just about every part of this process to go on there that if the problems were caused because of the uh, software being incorrect when reporting incorrect. Then, and, and the the amount due sh should not have been the, when I'm claiming the amount due should not have been with the 141,000 that the board was saying I was due. Then the int the interest should be a lot lower too. So with that respect, are you attributing the delay to the software or to actions taken by CDTFA? Both. Okay. So uh, one of the requirements for interest relief is that uh, you submit a signed declaration um, or a, a form called CDTFA 735, I believe. Um, and I don't, I don't see that in the appeal. Um, um, and part of that is that you specify the periods and the grounds um, for the interest relief. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, are, are you requesting to submit that form since you brought up interest relief? Yes, I would. You you will? I will submit like that form. I wasn't aware of that's, that. I was not aware that there was a form that I had to fill out for that. Okay. Um, and, and how long do you think you might need to submit such a form? Uh, since I have never seen the form, I don't know, basically I don't know how complicated the form is, would be, but I would uh, start working on it right away. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to refer it back over to Judge Wong, and he can help establish um, the time frame for that, um, but uh, it sounds like you're interested in it. Um, Judge Wong. Um, okay, let's see. We could hold the record open for, would two weeks be sufficient to for you to find and fill out and submit that form to CDTFA? Yeah, that, that'll be sufficient. Okay, and then um, I will give CDTFA two weeks as well to process the form. Judge Wong, since this hasn't been an issue in the past and we have to reach out to all the different areas within CDTFA, could we have 30 days, please? Sure. Thank you. Uh, okay. I mean, just to be fair, do you want 30 days, Mr. Talbert, or is 30 and 30? That's fine. Okay. Okay. Um, someone will try to get you that form today. Um, you have 30 days, but please try to submit it as soon as possible. And once you submit it to CDTFA, uh, then CDTFA will have 30 days to um, process that form. That's fine. Okay. Um, sorry, let me make a note. Okay, um, I had a few questions, uh, Mr. Tauberg, about um, your presentation. So, uh, so you had mentioned um, that you didn't know that the Retalic system was providing incorrect data until um, after the audit. That is correct. But you had appealed the, the tax bill, the notice of determination you received from CDTFA. Um, 
actually, hold on just a second. Okay, how did you know, um, how did you know that, what was the nature of the uh, errors in the Retallic system that came out of the audit? Well, the amounts that they were reporting on there of, uh, the, of uh, probably a sales and, t and tax due, the t total amounts were showing on there that I owed, that I owed more in sales tax. When the Retallic system went away, those uh, those amounts went down to just about zero. Now I didn't do anything different when I was doing the tax returns. Pull, tried to pull, I pulled the da same data from the, tried pulling the same data the same way from the system, and submitted it that way. So while you had the Retallic system itself, there's nothing to indicate to you that you were reporting incorrectly? That is correct. And so it was only after um, you had this new POS system and that you you surmised that the Retallic system was, was uh, producing incorrect data. That is correct. And the POS system was the only records you kept as far as your sales and the POS the back office system what it did, what it did it transmitted the it transmitted data uh, from there to to Arco and Arco then pro, uh, sent data to, uh, sent the data that data to a, an S two S two K system which uh, is a there's another company which provided reports. Up until when the new system went in, uh, the they prov also provided a completely different S2K system to report the to report data back, which which gave us all the daily reports and month monthly reports and everything else that were used. So the S2K system that was in place during the uh, liability period at issue? That, that's correct. The S2K system has been in use uh, for many years. It's a rep uh, it's a basically a reporting system that uh, some other company came up there with which ARCO uh, uses. They were using a subset of it when they were using Retallics and then they had a, it was completely modified and a new, and a new version of, uh, of it went in there with a lot more uh, reporting and things to see, which you could, which you could, which you could get out of it, uh, when they got rid of the Retallic system. Were there any records from the S two S K two system from the liability period? Uh, not anymore. They during that period of time, they they're probably they're gone. I can't pull back data back from that anymore. Okay. But what you reported on your sales and use tax returns for the liability period was based on the Retallic system. It the, the Retal basically it's based on a Retallic system that reported stuff back that went through to the to another system, the S two K system. They would which would pull it. So were you reporting data from the S two K system well, or the Retallic system? It's or it's a combination of both because the the S two K system. The Retallic system fed the S2K system. So the S2K system's data was correct, but the Retallic system was incorrect? No, the, the S2K system back there, the system could only take the data that's presented to it. Okay. The, the, the Retallic system at the time was reporting incorrect data to it. So the data that it was, provi it was providing to me was, in, was basically the data that it was getting from the back office system, the, the Retallic's back office system. And the way you know that data was incorrect was basically comparing it to what the, the successor um, POS no, system was producing? No, I knew it was incorrect 
when I saw the audit, when the audit was showing that the last three quarters of the audit, everything, uh, I was reporting everything correctly when I wasn't doing anything, di you know, different when I was report, uh, doing the tax returns. So you, what did you base the tax return data on? Because that, because for your um, unreported taxable sales, based on what I understand CDTA's audit, CDTFA's audit method, they compared what you reported to what was recorded by your records. And there was a difference there. And so the unreported sales you're claiming is based on the retalic system, which is incorrect. And, but your, what you reported on your sales and use tax returns, I'm assuming you're saying that's correct. So no. how did you report the, like what, why is there a difference between what no. you recorded and what you reported? What I'm, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, I, re, I reported what basically what the retalic system said. The retalic system gave it gave it to S2K, and I, that's I could see the same basically the same thing from S2K that what retalics was given. So uh, where did the error come in from the retalic system? So the retalic system basically is from the retalic system that was causing the error. So there, so the retalic system is producing two sets of data, one to no, you. No, one, one set of data. Okay. So where's the the discrepancy between what was reported and recorded coming from? That that I can't say where Arco was getting their portion of the data or or where where that was coming from. That I can't say. Okay. You know, I was, you know, one of the one of the things, as I said before, that I had offered to work with Ar with Arco on looking at the retaliate system. Then I would have been able to have more insight of where of where everything was coming from on on that point. But since I since they refused to let me help, help them at all, at, you know, I was going to do it for, for for nothing. You know, basically to get the system to work correctly. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to turn to um, the rebates um, from your vendors. It looks like from soda, beer, and cigarettes. Is that correct? Can you repeat that again? I wanted to turn to the, the rebates that you received from vendors, the soda, beer, and cigarettes. Is that correct? Okay. Um, and so you received those rebates, that, or sorry, the appellant your company received those rebates, is that right? That, that is correct. And what were they received for? They were received for the amount of product that we sold on there. They Those rebates were never factored into the sales price on there where where we would give the customers a, a reduction, like they would use a coupon, and we would give a coupon use a coupon. There were no such things as coupons on there. So it did not affect the sales price at all. So there was no sale uh there was no sales tax on it. That was something that more is income coming to us afterwards on there that is reported uh to the franchise uh to the IRS and the franchise tax board as income. Do you have um a copy of any of these agreements with your vendors for the liability period with the terms of um, these payments? Well, that, mo that money went back, basically that money went back to ARCO and then ARCO then sent it to us. It was not, did not come directly to that. The agreements were between ARCO and the vendors. Do you have, no, so you do not have a copy of the? No, I do not. Okay. They, that was never, those agreements were never provided to any of the franchisees. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Talberg. That's, those are all the questions I have for now. Okay, we will now turn it over to CDTFA for uh, their presentation. Uh, you have 20 minutes. Thank you. The appellant is a limited liability uh, corporation operating an Arcos gas station with a mini mart in Riverside, California. Audit period is from October 1, 2012 through September 30th, 2015. Appellant has been previously audited. The department reviewed appellant's federal income tax returns for 2013 and 2014. P&L statements for 2013, 2014, and 2015. 
The department also obtained retail gasoline pricing information for the Los Angeles metropolitan area from the U.S. Department of Energy for the audit period. Total sales for the audit period amounted to almost $31 million. Exemptions claimed included non-taxable food sales, labor, state excise on diesel, bad debts, and partial exempt motor vehicle fuel sales. Total exemptions claimed were over $29 million. Taxable sales reported were just over $1.5 million. Exhibit D, pages 37 and 38. The department compared federal income tax returns to reported sales for 2013 and 2014 and a difference of, over, of just over $100,000 for the two-year period was revealed. Exhibit D, page 88. The department scheduled appellant's recorded fuel sales and mini-mart sales from appellant's monthly sales summaries for the period from January 1, 2013 through September 30, 2015, Exhibit D, page 87, and also transcribed appellant's purchases per profit and loss statements, Exhibit D, page 86. Comparison of recorded sales <coughs> to recorded purchases disclosed markups of around 6% for fuel and just over 26% for taxable mini-mart sales. Exhibit D, page 85. The department found these markups to be reasonable and accepted them. Comparison of reported taxable sales of over $1.2 million, Exhibit D, page 79, to audited taxable purchases of just over $2.1 million, Exhibit D, page 85, for the period of January 1, 2013 through September 30, 2015 showed a negative gross profit of $861,000 and a markup of negative 41%. That is using reported Minimart taxable sales to recorded Minimart taxable purchases. The department found that the reported sales amounts for the Minimart to be unreasonable and therefore did not accept them. The department reconciled appellant's various recorded taxable sales to its reported sales. For appellant's gasoline sales, the reconciliation disclosed an overreporting of $460,000, so the department allowed a credit for the difference, Exhibit D, pages 83 and 53. The reconciliation of recorded diesel sales to reported diesel sales disclosed an underreporting of $49,000, Exhibit D, pages 80 and 53. And the reconciliation of recorded mini market taxable sales to reported mini market taxable sales showed appellant had underreported taxable sales of close to $1.7 million. Exhibit D, pages 79 and 53. Further, a review of sales tax computed per taxable sales of mini market sales to sales tax collected per appellant's tax summary reports revealed that the appellant collected tax on some exempt sales. Therefore, the appellant had excess, tax, excess sales tax reimbursement, Exhibit D, page 71. The excess, excess sales tax reimbursement are included in the audit, page, uh, Exhibit D, page 52. As sales tax reconciliation was also performed using the appellant's sales tax summary reports. Comparison to reported sales tax disclosed, a difference of almost $132,000 in sales tax, Exhibit D, pages 73 through 75. Appellant claimed exempt labor sales of $117,000. These claims were disallowed as review of records disclosed no exempt labor sales, Exhibit D, page 77. Appellant claimed other deductions which included state excise tax on diesel of over $1 million. The department determined the amount claimed was overstated. Only $11,000 of state excise tax on diesel was found to be properly claimed and supported. The remaining amount, still totaling over $1 million, was disallowed. Exhibit D, page 76. Bad debts were not recorded on the federal income tax returns provided. Exhibit D, pages, page 88, and were not supported by the appellant. Therefore, claimed bad debts were disallowed. Then to ensure that the recorded amounts were accurate, 
the department computed taxable sales for both fuel sales and mini mart sales using alternative methods. For fuel sales, a weighted selling price per gallon for all grades of gasoline and diesel was determined using the U.S. Department of Energy data for the Los Angeles metropolitan area for the audit period, Exhibit D, pages 60 through 68. Appellant's average per gallon selling price of gasoline and diesel was established based on January through June 2015 recorded sales of gasoline and diesel sales divided by recorded gasoline and diesel gallons sold, Exhibit D, page 59. A comparison was made between U.S. Department of Energy average per gallon prices to recorded average per gallon prices for the January through June 2015 period. Based on the difference, the department discounted the U.S. Department of Energy pricing by over 10 percent, Exhibit D, page 59, to establish the appellant's audited per gallon selling prices for the audit period, Exhibit D, page 58. The audited per gallon selling prices was applied to recorded gallons sold to determine audited fuel sales. Exhibit D, page 57. Recorded Mini Mart taxable cost of goods sold, adjusted for both self consumption and pilferage, were applied to the weighted markup computed in the appellant's prior audit. Exhibit H, page 194. To determine audited taxable sales. Exhibit D, pages 69 and 70. The audited gasoline sales, diesel sales, and mini mart sales totaled just over $29.05 million. Recorded sales of the same items totaled just over, or excuse me, the audited gasoline sale, the audited gasoline sales, diesel sales, and mini mart sales totaled just under $29.05 million. Recorded sales of the same items totaled just over $29.05 million. Exhibit D, page 55. The difference, which is only $27,000, is within one-tenth of a percent of the recorded sales amounts. Exhibit D, page 96. The recorded sales <coughs> were found to be acceptable, and the department's assessment is based on the appellant's own records, which were verified using accepted alternative methods. When comparing the sales tax reconciliation difference of just under 132,000, Exhibit D, page 170, page 73, to assessed sales tax in the audit net of taxable rebates, which is just over 132,000, the $448 difference in sales tax is within 0.35 percent of recorded tax collected by the appellant. Exhibit D, page 97. In addition, the prior audit, which covered the period from October 1st, 2009 through September 30th, 2012, also assessed a vast majority of the assessment due to sales tax recorded versus sales tax reported differences. Exhibit H, page 243. Profit and loss statements disclosed rebate income was received from beer, soda, and tobacco vendors. The rebate amount assessed for the audit period is $60,000, Exhibit D, page 54. The appellant has not provided evidence to show that the rebates were included in the taxable sales amounts reported to the department, nor has the appellant provided evidence to show that the rebates are of an exempt nature. As such, no adjustment is warranted in this area. The appellant's prior audit also assessed taxable rebate income of $125,000. Exhibit H, page 242. Again, the department used the appellant's own records to determine the unreported taxable sales and used alternative records to show that the records are accurate. Appellant has not shown that records specific to their system are erroneous. As stated earlier, this is the appellant's second audit. Appellant was aware of how to report the proper amount of sales and sales tax. The same issues applied in the prior audit that occurred in this audit. The appellant failed to correct errors they knew existed. The amount of total unreported taxable measure is almost $2 million, which is significant. Appellant did collect sales tax on items at issue. Appellant would have known based on the sales reports, sales tax 
on the sales reports, sales tax reports, and unsupported exemptions claims of almost $1.2 million that they were not reporting collect, uh, correctly. Therefore, the negligence penalty is warranted. This concludes my presentation. I'm available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. I'll now turn to my co-panelists for any questions uh, for CDTFA, uh, beginning with uh, Judge Aldrich. Uh, no questions, thank you. Thank you. Judge Brown? I have, may have one question for CDTFA, um, and it, it's a similar question to what I asked the appellant. Uh, I was trying to understand what was going on with references in, for example, the appeals decision to a, what appeared to be a different point of sale system than Retalics, and I wanted to know if CDTFA can enlighten that. Is that the uh, S, sorry, S2K system that appellant referred to, or is it something different? It's sort of ambiguous, so I can't tell you for sure. Mm -hmm. Based on what he has said today, I would assume that's the case. But like he said, the Retalic system gets fed into the, um, the secondary system. It can only accept, it would only spit out the same numbers that it accepted. And I guess I want to ask if CDTFA um, can address appellant's arguments regarding the uh, the error, whether the errors with the the alleged errors with the Retalix system would have um, resulted in incorrect reporting and re incorrect or incorrect recording. Um, does, is there a reason why CDTFA uh, isn't concerned about uh, any discrepancies in that? When we did the alternative methods, we did both a markup on mini mart sales and we did a uh, cost of gallons sold to the average selling price based on both U.S. Department of Energy and the, and the uh, appellant's uh, selling price, which was discounted because he sold less than what is the average for the metropolitan area. When you take those two items into account, alternative methods, they come out to within 0 0.10 of what the recorded sales are. Out of the $29 million that was sold, there's only a $27,000 difference. So basically, what, he, what was recorded was correct in our eyes based on an alternative method. If you look at where the difference truly lies, it's in the mini-mart sales. The mini mart sales <coughs> reported were only like 1.3 million, I believe, or 1.2 million. But the recorded mini mart sales, and if you marked them up, you would see that it's a huge difference there. And that's where a majority of the of the uh, of the liability is created, because again, when you look at what is reported versus the uh, recorded mini mart taxable sales. It's a negative 860, I think it was $862,000 gross profit, which is impossible. You wouldn't be buying something for a dollar and selling it for 60 cents, especially not at a uh, AM PM mini mart. Actually, the 31% markup that is calculated by the auditor in the previous audit is rather low for a mini mart because normally uh, a mini mart is between anywhere from 45 to possibly 80 percent on uh, for a gasoline mini mart because basically you're just going to the items, you're grabbing them, and you're taking off. So there's not much. You're not going to go to a Safeway or a uh, another a Costco or something like that to shop around. You're just it's impulse. It's an impulse buy. So the markup's going to be higher. Okay. So like if you need a, a pack of cigarettes or you need a, a soda, whatever, you're not going to go and uh, shop around to get a 12-pack of Coke or a 24-ounce 20, uh, 20 or 24 case at Costco. You're just going to go and you're going to spend a dollar twenty-five on a can of Coke, which, you know, if you go someplace else, it's not going to be nearly that much. 
so again the, the in a way the the markup is conservative but the markup shows that the pricing on everything is is based on his recorded amounts is correct and is where he's saying that he's getting these differences I'm uh, same in nature as judge Wong because if he's using the retallic system there should be no differences if he's using the retallic system to report but obviously something occurred and something else occurred was that he has these um, exemptions that he's taking of over a million dollars that he can't have that doesn't have backup for and a hundred and some thousand dollars in labor which if you ever go to an Arco Mini Mart there is no real labor they're not fixing cars so uh, that sort of the total sales look closer than it was but when you actually get to the taxable sales because of those exemptions that were not allowed it comes out close to what somewhat close to what the Mini Mart is that answer your question a long winded way <laughs> judge brown i just wanted to add one quick thing to to this also if you look at the recorded mini mart sales they they range somewhere around two hundred forty thousand uh, per quarter on a consistent basis and the reported amounts for the mini mart range from zero to about two hundred forty thousand in the later periods but they were very low in the um the years 2013, 2014, and in fourth quarter 2012, it was zero. So just looking at those two differences, the, the recorded remained consistent, but the reported for the mini mart varied greatly, and that's where the bulk of the audit difference comes from. And if he says that his reporting is correctly, it's like, well, we, get, we did allow for $460,000 uh, credit on the sale of gasoline based on what he was reported versus, versus um, what was reported on the gasoline, which was also verified again by the, uh, the alternative method test. I have nothing further right now, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just had a, a couple questions for CDTFA regarding the um, prior audit, which was for October 2009 through uh, September 30th, 2012. Uh, did appellant appeal that prior audit? I do not believe so. I didn't look to see. Mr. Talbot, did you appeal that? No, no, I did not. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if it had gone through the normal um, appeals process and went up to the Board of Equalization and whatnot, but you did not appeal that prior um, determination. Okay. Okay. Um, I did not have any further questions for CDTFA. Um, Mr. Talberg, um, you now have 12 minutes for your uh, rebuttal and closing. You may begin. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, as far as the reportings on there, the reports that I pulled out for uh, the audit were, pull, were pulled from not uh, when they actually happened, but they were pulled when the audit was, occur was occurring on there. So I was going through a new system which had been re reloaded with data by Arco, so I'm not sure of the values that they were on there. So, so what I'm saying is that there was a, there could have been, and I can't prove it, a difference between what I reported because of, the, of what I saw on the rep on the reports that I got back from uh, the Retallic system versus the reports that I provided uh, the board when they're doing the audit because they came from a new system. That's all I can say about that. Um, but you know, I I cannot un I cannot. There's no way that I can say uh, where any di where or how any of the differences did occur, though. But uh, as far as the other stuff, I can't. I can't 
you know, I, right now I don't know uh, what else to say on it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tauberg. Um, okay, for the final time, I will now turn to my co-panelists for any uh, questions for either appellant or um, respondent, uh, beginning with Judge Aldrich. Uh, no further questions, thank you. Judge Brown? No further questions, thank you. Um, I, I guess one last question, uh, Mr. Talberg, did you want to address the negligence penalty at all? The, the what? The negligence penalty. Uh, yes, I would, because I don't think I did anything uh, neg negligent. I think, you know, what I, what I reported is what I got back from the system on there. It wasn't anything that I was uh, intentionally uh, doing that was that would call negligence on there. Uh, everything was being reported as it was being presented to me at the time. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I think we're ready to wrap up. Uh, just to recap, um, we do have the Form 735 that um, someone will provide you regarding um, interest relief, request for interest relief and um, penalties. Um, you'll have 30 days to uh, fill that out and turn it into CDTFA. Um, please put copy on us on that and CDTFA will have 30 days from when you turn that in um, to, to analyze it, process that. Um, I will be issuing an order with memorializing these, um, these dates and deadlines. Uh, we're going to hold the uh, yeah. It will be thirty days from tomorrow. Hang on, just one second. Oh yes, the um, BOE or sorry, CDTFA seven thirty five. The form only relates to um, interest relief and um, not the negligence penalty. I think we've already got your arguments regarding the negligence penalty and whatnot. Um, and so 30 days from tomorrow, you'll have 30 days from tomorrow to um, sub submit that. And then once, once you submit that, um, CDTFA will have 30 days from then to turn that in. And I will be issuing an order uh, with these deadlines. And let me just double check something. OK. Um, this concludes the hearing. The record is not closed. We're holding that open. Um, and then just uh, be on the lookout for that order and that BOE, or CDTFA 735. Um, so this will end the hearing, and we uh, will take a recess until the next hearing, which is 1 p.m. this afternoon. Let's go off the record. Thank you, everybody.